You're listening to John Fame on 774 ABC Melbourne and on digital. The Prime Minister Tony Abbott is in Melbourne this morning but flying out after various functions and commitments in the city last night. He joins me as he's on his way to the airport this morning. Mr Abbott, good morning to you. John, it's nice to be with you. I understand you're announcing the terms of reference of the Royal Commission into Industrial Relations today. What, how extensive will they be? Well, they're fairly extensive. Uh, George Brandis, the Attorney General, will be doing this later on today. Um, basically, we want to get to the bottom of uh, uh, corruption and, and poor governance uh, inside industrial organisations. Uh, this is something we took to the election. We said there would be a judicial inquiry uh, into uh, union corruption, into the use of slush funds, and that's what's happening. Why not just have a Royal Commission into the ALP? Why not just have a Royal Commission into Bill Shorten, which seems to be what you're hoping to achieve? You'll save everybody a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, look, John, uh, it's important that we get to the bottom of this. I think we owe it to honest workers and honest unionists to ensure that these organisations are as clean as they can be. But that's the political intent, is it not, to make as much trouble for the Labor Party as you can? Well, the, the, the intent is to try to ensure that we get a better system. The intent is to try to ensure that uh, we have honest unions. Now, this is a problem for the Labor Party. I accept that because uh, for too long, uh, too many members of the Labor Party have been defending the indefensible. But, look, we've had, uh, we've had uh, people like Cathy Jackson um, heroically heroically say that uh, enough is enough, it's all got to stop. And, and, and I think that the honest people inside the union movement, the honest people inside the Labor Party will welcome this Royal Commission. What does it achieve, Prime Minister? There's been several, in fact, multiple attempts at exactly the same thing in the past. And they come, there's a bit of, you know, a few people get carted away in handcuffs. Sometimes it must be said uh, as much property developers and business figures as it is union leaders. And then everything just sort of muddles along afterwards. Well, I'm not sure it's as quite as, uh, as depressing as that. Uh, uh, yes, sometimes the... the the people who are exposed in these royal commissions uh, are uh, uh, developers who've done the wrong thing, and, and that's as it should be. And the other point I should make, John, is that uh, there was the Coal Royal Commission into the commercial construction industry back a decade or so ago when I was the workplace minister, and as a result of that, we established the Australian Building and Construction Commission, and that delivered something like $6 billion a year in additional productivity in this sector. It was a watershed for the commercial construction sector. Unfortunately, under the former government, uh, many of those important reforms were wound back. Um, the, uh, the thuggery, it seems, has started again. And it's important that we get to the bottom of that. The last thing you want is organised crime uh, active on building sites. So this is uh, declaring war on the CFMEU and they'll have to undoubtedly and they will defend their patch as best they can. Uh, there's nothing quick in a Royal Commission as you're already aware, Tony Abbott. So is the timing to try and have all of this crystallised in time for the next federal election? Well, the hope is that the Royal Commission will report by the end of the year. Now, it is ultimately in the hands of the Royal Commissioner. Uh, if he wants more time... Uh, he can always ask for it, but uh, we want this to be over by the end of the year and we want to try to ensure that the results uh, of this Royal Commission are acted upon uh, as quickly as we humanly can. But this isn't declaring war on anyone, John. Uh, it's declaring war on, on wrongdoing. It's declaring war on corruption. It's, uh, it's, it's declaring that there are certain standards in our society and uh, whether you're a company official or a union official, you've got to obey the law and you've got to use the money that you are entrusted with honestly. Then why not have a national anti-corruption body? You've got state-based bodies in pretty much every jurisdiction, but there's nothing federally. Are you looking towards eventually coming up with a federal anti-corruption commission? Well, let's see what the Royal Commission recommends. Uh, it's not the policy that we took to the election and um, generally speaking, uh, we're 
like in the business of doing what we took to the election, not other things. No, but, but if uh, someone comes up with a good idea and there's a glaring and obvious need for it, and I'd say there is, how can a country with an economy as sophisticated as ours not have a standing anti-corruption body? Well, as I said, uh, John, that's a, a, fair, a fair question, and we've got them now in most of the states. Uh, let's see what the uh, Royal Commission recommends. But the fundamental point I ought to make is that good unions have nothing to fear uh, from this Royal Commission, and good union officials have nothing to fear from this Royal Commission. It's only people who have been doing the wrong thing that uh, this Commission obviously will be looking at. What's the definition of a good union? One that rolls over and has its tummy tickled by the Abbott <laughs> government? <laughs> I don't know which one that might be, but uh, look, uh, John, a, a good union is one where uh, members' money is honestly administered uh, and which is out there trying to ensure that its members aren't oppressed which is out there trying to ensure that its members' jobs are maximised. And, and look, uh, I think everyone is in favour of that kind of unionism. Um, sadly, not all unions uh, basically conform uh, to that, uh, that kind of ideal. Given that on Saturday there are two state elections in South Australia and Tasmania that will give you almost unanimity, leaving out just the ACTU, the ACT from uh, COAG, uh, you'll have Conservative governments in, in power in... Canberra and almost everywhere around the country. Is that the sort of reform then that you could put through? Some uniform laws about corruption or about union uh, excesses whilst you've got the numbers right around the nation? Well, a couple of points, John. First of all, uh, there's no likelihood of the ACT becoming uh, a Liberal territory anytime soon. And uh, Second, second, uh, I don't think we should take anything for granted here. I, I, I was looking at some polling and uh, the advertiser says that in key marginal seats, the Labor Party is ahead in South Australia. So I don't think anyone should take anything for granted. I suppose the final point to make is that uh, it's not the complexion of the state government which counts, it's the competence of the state government which counts. And the problem we've had in South Australia and in, in Tasmania is that we've got very long-serving state Labor governments which are well past their prime. Uh, in the case of the Tasmanian Labor government, uh, they're basically repudiating the last four years because they say that this whole alliance with the Greens was a terrible mistake. What, uh, what's the take-home message from yesterday's jobs figures from Tony Abbott's perspective? We've seen, particularly in Victoria, the manufacturing base of the car industry smashed, job losses with Qantas, state government retrenchments. In Victoria, there's a feeling of great pessimism mm -hmm. about jobs, and then yesterday's figures suggest, indeed, that maybe the rest of the nation's going in a different direction. Well, obviously, <clears throat> John, they're encouraging figures. Uh, we had something like uh, 47,000 net new jobs uh, created in the month and uh, full-time jobs growth is, uh, is, is quite strong according to the statistics. That doesn't mean though that we should be complacent about uh, what's happening in some of our large and iconic businesses. Uh, the point I keep making though is that in a dynamic market economy uh, some jobs will end, other jobs will start and the point of government is to try to ensure that you've got the conditions in place so that uh, people can go from good jobs to better jobs if needed. Sure, be. but in this state there's tens of thousands of jobs that are going and little expectation that the era of entitlement approach that you and Joe yeah. Hockey take will mean that you'll do much to replace them in Victoria. Well, well, John, as I said, I, I, I understand that people are apprehensive in Victoria and my job is to give them confidence. and That's one of the reasons why I'm so, so committed to the East-West Link, uh, the first stage of East West Link will create uh, nearly three and a half thousand construction jobs. I'm talking to Premier Dennis Napfine about the second stage of East West Link because if we can do the two concurrently, obviously that's uh, another. 3,000 or more jobs. Although and most of the people listening are now starting to shout at their radio that they wish you'd fund Metro Rail rather than just more and more toll roads. Well, I want to see better Metro Rail too. I really do. Then but pay for Metro, it. Well, <laughs> the, the, the metropolitan rail systems are owned and operated by the state governments and 
if we're helping the state governments with road projects, that frees them up to work on the rail projects. But I mean, toll roads are run by the private sector and you're kicking money into that. Why not kick money into public transport instead of private toll roads? Because the important thing is that we get the infrastructure that we need. That's the important thing. We need Metro Rail. And, and each level of government should do what is its responsibility. Now, uh, I want to make sure that it's easier for the state government to get on with building the most important single infrastructure project in Victoria, which is East West Link, which will help this city. And this city is the greatest economic asset that Victoria has. It will be of enormous benefit to anyone trying to move around the great city of Melbourne. So that's what I want to see happen as quickly as possible. Prime now, Minister, obviously, it's been, it's if, we're been... tipping, if we're tipping billions of dollars into East West Link, it makes it a lot easier for the state government to then get cracking with Metro Rail. It's been said to me by one of your backbenchers, a Liberal Victorian backbencher, that Queensland's got Barnaby Joyce, who can throw a good tantrum for mm. Queensland round the Cabinet table. Uh, Christopher Pine's pretty good at thumping the table for South Australia and Erica Betts does a great job for Tasmania, but Victoria doesn't have anybody that gets your attention Nobody who forces Victoria's case. We've got Greg Hunt, who's a very effective environment minister, but yep. uh, Kevin Andrews and uh, Andrew Robb, but we haven't got someone there who, who grabs the cabinet room by the throat and shakes it to get what Victoria needs. Fair criticism mm. or not? I, I think a little unfair uh, because you've named three outstanding cabinet ministers, all of whom are doing an excellent job. And look, uh, I spend half my life in Melbourne. Um, I mean, Melbourne is a great city. Uh, Victoria is a great state. Uh, I accept that it's had some, it's had some uh, bad news lately, but I think the people of Victoria are very resilient and, and I think they'll come through this. And I'm likely to spend even more time in Melbourne in the uh, months ahead because uh, my middle daughter, Frances, uh, is, an, is an enthusiastic new Melburnian, an enthusiastic new Melburnian. Well, maybe, she, maybe when she gets your ear, that'll change things. <laughs> Our time is limited. I, I understand that you're not fussed with the departure from the top of Treasury of Treasury Secretary Martin Parkinson, and you're quoted in one of the newspapers today as saying that you're quite happy to stamp your authority on the nation's economic agencies. What happened to fearless independent advice from public servants? And, and I very much support uh, the traditional Westminster concept of, uh, of, of uh, free and frank advice, frank and fearless advice from the public service. And, and Martin Parkinson has been an outstanding public servant, a very effective, very powerful head of Treasury. Um, but we said when we came in that we did want to stamp our authority uh, on particularly the economic agencies. But does but, that mean uh, getting rid of anyone who doesn't see the no, world no, the Tony Abbott way? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all, John. It doesn't mean that at all. And, look, I've worked very constructively with Martin Parkinson. Uh, Joe Hockey has uh, always got on with Martin Parkinson. He, he is, a, is an outstanding public servant uh, of, of international standing. Uh, he really is a, a very good public servant and... I'm looking forward to working with him uh, for quite some time to come because he's got a lot to contribute to our nation. But meanwhile, you'll replace him with someone who sees the world your way and that means eventually you end up, you surround yourself with people who are a monoculture and the government suffers from the lack of contestability of ideas. We've seen it happen before. We've seen it happen with Labor governments. We've seen it happen with Conservative governments. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter. It's never a good look. Well, I'm not sure if you... Uh listen to the economic debate in our country, uh, uh, watch the media debate in our country, anyone would say that the coalition got it all its own way. I mean, we plainly don't have it all our own way. And, uh, and look, at, uh, we get advice from a, from a wide range of sources. But the point I make is that I'm looking forward to working with Martin Parkinson for quite some time to come. And... Um, uh, I suppose everyone moves on eventually, but when uh, he does move on, uh, as all of us must eventually, he'll certainly go uh, with the respect of the government and ought to go with the gratitude of the Australian people. And Prime Minister, you're on your way out of Melbourne at the moment on your